Hello up there. Hello, can y'all hear me? I can hear you, this is Nikki. Hey, Nikki, how's it going? Good. And I can hear you, this is Mike. Great, thanks so much, Mike. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Can you hear me out there? And thank you to Mike Strands as well. Yeah, I noticed uh, Mike Strands and, and, and Nikki you both are, uh, oops, sorry, you both are. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. I can't, I, can hear, I can't hear you. Oh, you, you can't hear me? Can't hear her. Let's see. Um. Hmm. But Nikki, you can hear me, right? Anybody else talking right now? I can't hear anything. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear Stu. Okay. I can also hear <laughs> Mike. Okay, yeah. Mike, I wonder I wonder if your volume's not up or something. The, the other thing that, that might help um, is if you, you can do the call-in audio. I can sometimes hear you, just, uh, yeah. you and Nikki. Sometimes you just need Perfect. to change the source of your speakers too. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I can hear you now. This is good. Hey, awesome, awesome. Nice. <laughs> it's always fun to make it a little more exciting at the last minute. Yeah, yes, absolutely. 
Absolutely. So I think we're just waiting on um, Jane in that case, who I'll watch for um, in the attendees here. But I don't know if y'all saw my email, but we had, uh, you know, final final ish counts on registrants was, was 73 people. So it should be a good a good conversation, some good participation. And then I know there's some 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 folks who call me often on meat processing who who weren't able to join. And so we're we're recording the conversation and and hopefully they'll be able to, to, to catch up afterwards. So. That's good. Nikki, this is a funny thing, but I'm I'm wondering your uh, name, as I see it, is Stu Laurie, which is probably a, an issue on our end, um, and 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 definitely our fault. But I'm wondering, I can't seem to rename your your video feed from my end. Is there any chance you can do that by clicking on the three dots from your video? I will see if I can do that. I noticed that someone else was named Stu Laurie. I think maybe Mike when he chatted too. So he, he, he I wish was. I was. And then we got yeah. <laughs> we we got that we got that changed on the back end. Okay, let me Not see. Cool. Well, for some reason, we couldn't figure out yours. Sometimes it does that when you go in through a link or something like that. But oh, seems... that that actually makes sense because I sent you um, the, I... the link to click. That I got okay. Yep. I just used the link that um, I could try rejoining with a different link. That could work. Although I mean, I don't think it's the biggest deal either. I don't think anyone's gonna gonna mis mistake us. All right. I can't. Normally, I know on other Zoom calls, I've been able to rename myself, but I can't get it up on this one for some reason. Yeah. That's. Same. That's the same that, uh, that that I was thinking. So, actually, what I'll do okay. is I will I will join using the other link, and I'll stay on on this link for the moment, too. Okay. I I can oh, that sounds perfect. That. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, I last I checked on the uh, attendees, we were up to seventy-seven. So, awesome. Should be, should be a good good talk, and it's like we got twenty-one on so far. Fantastic. And Brita, you're recording this, right? Or is Glenn handling that? Glenn, Glenn should be. Yeah. The, 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 the MFU logo is Glenn. Great. It's recording automatically. We're good to go. Great. Here we go. And then Nikki, I think I, I think I, um, promoted your your second call in to a panelist as well. Okay, I'm going to drop off this one. That's good. Aaron. Hey, Jane. Love your okay. background as always. <laughs> yeah, I, I switch around between chickens, cows, and pigs. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. All, all of which would be would be welcome in this conversation. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, great. Well, we'll just give folks uh, another minute here, um, and then we'll get rolling. So, Stu, is mine up correctly now with my name? It is. Awesome. Yep. Okay. Yep. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Nope. <laughs> Always. 
always learn something new about Zoom on these calls. So. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, that's good. All right. Well, we're at at, at, at 10 a.m. here. So as as folks will uh, join, can continue joining in these next couple of minutes, I'll just get started with some brief uh, housekeeping notes. So first, thank you all uh, so much for making the time. Recognize that there are a lot of important uh, demands on your time right now. Um, you know, meat processing, you know, the reason for this conversation is meat processing is a challenge for so many of our members and, and you all are, are working actively to, 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 to meet those needs for our members every day. And so taking the, the opportunity to, to um, take part in a, a, a conversation like this is, is, is really valued and, and we appreciate it. Um, a, a couple other housekeeping notes before I move over to our four panelists for introductions. Uh, first, um, this will be an hour long conversation and I'll work to wrap it up promptly by 11 a.m. to respect everyone's time. Um, for folks who uh, are MFU members or friends who've joined the panel, uh, joined panels in the past. Previously, we've had everyone up on the screen as kind of a one big conversation. This time we're trying a, a webinar format uh, because we have some more folks registered. So. Same as always, if you have questions during the Q&A, and I hope you came with some, uh, throw those in the chat. And then what I'll do is I will um, not only unmute you, but invite you to be a panelist in case you want to use your video to uh, share uh, your question uh, for, for, for reactions from our panel here. So um, starting now, just uh, start throwing uh, questions in the chat. I also have my cell phone. I know a lot of folks who are registered. If you want to shoot me a text and that's easier, feel free to do that too. And we'll get to as many uh, questions as we can. Um, uh, the, just an FYI to everyone, the call is being recorded and, and we'll post that later for any members or friends who, who missed it. And um, you know, finally, just a note, it's probably true for, for all hour long webinars, but you know, this in particular is an issue we've been working on for a long time. We're not going to be able to cover everything in an hour. And so I certainly, and I think uh, we all should look at this as the, the start of a conversation and hopefully there's some new ideas and, and opportunities to continue that conversation going forward. So um, with that, our, 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 our panelists are uh, Dr. Nicole Mieser, who's the um, director of the Dairy Meat Inspection Program at, at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So we so appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Jane Jewett, who's associate director at the um, Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture. Mike Strands, who is our Vice President of Advocacy at, at, at National Farmers Union and works on these issues on the national level on behalf of our members. And, and, and finally, uh, Mike Lawrence, who's CEO of, of, of Lawrence Meats in Cannon Falls, and, and so appreciate you taking the time to share your, your, your insights and, and add to this conversation. So with that, I'll, I'll maybe turn it to uh, Nikki, first, if you're open to that, to uh, share a couple uh, opening thoughts and and introduce yourself for uh, participants and, and share some about your work on on, on meat processing. Sure, thanks, Stu. Um, I am uh, Dr. Nikki Neeser. I work for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and I'm the director of dairy and meat inspection, as Stu mentioned. So, for the purposes of today's discussion, I'll focus mainly on meat processing. Um, my job is to um, provide oversight to our Minnesota State Equal to Inspection Program. So those inspection plans that um, the inspection program that we manage in cooperation with USDA Food Safety Inspection Service to um, do continuous inspection on animals through slaughter and processing. Um, we've got about um, 50, well, we're probably up to about 58 plants right now on that program. And um, my job in particular is just to do oversight of that program. Got lots of great uh, staff that do supervision and management of that program. And then lots of our field inspectors in the field working with plants. Um, during the recent few months of COVID, obviously the meat inspection industry has been impacted greatly, uh, particularly our small and local plants. Um, after some of our large plants went down. And so we've been working pretty hard to get um, 
more plants under equal to inspection. We've been working pretty hard to get other plants permitted as custom exempt um, that weren't previously permitted or licensed. And then um, working with folks who are interested in buildings. So there's a few plant, a few people that have purchased plants or are, are interested in building or moving maybe a mobile unit or something onto their property. Um, so we've been number one working working during the COVID um, doing inspection. In fact, we've actually added um, a couple part-time staff to help fill in inspection shifts and um, done some training with some new folks to just expand our capacity. So um, that's kind of our role. Um, I also do a little policy um, with USDA, you know, a little bit on the state and federal level when those issues come up. Fantastic. Thank you for that introduction and, 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 and for all your work. I'm sure Mike uh, Strands can comment on this, but it's, it's, it's always been exciting for me to share the work, the proactive work through COVID that, that Minnesota is doing. And I think we got a lot of great uh, examples to point to and, and the way we've been moving a, a lot of plants uh, up in the inspection status is, is, is a great example of that. So uh, next, if, if, if we could go to Jane and maybe you could share a little bit about uh, your work on this issue. Sure, hi, uh, yeah, I'm Jane Jewett and in my work for the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture, um, part of our mission is to uh, support and promote sustainable farming and a big part of that is um, local and regional food systems. Okay, so those, uh, those really depend on people being able to understand and follow the regulations for whatever um, type of food they happen to be selling. And so a lot of my work over the past few years has been working really closely with Nikki Neeser and her team at the Department of Ag to uh, sort through and untangle all the permutations of ways that people can legally sell beef, pork, chicken, lamb, um, you know, other poultry, uh, game species, and, and get that sorted out and laid out in a way that farmers and farm advisors can follow it and understand it and find it when they need it. So, um, so that's been the work side of what I do. And then I also farm. That is my actual herd of cattle in the background behind me from a picture from a few years ago. And uh, I am a licensed retail mobile food handler and um, truck my animals quite a distance to find processing that is equal to or USDA inspected and, uh, and then market at farmers markets. So I'm, I'm out there experiencing the processing bottlenecks that uh, we hear so much about and um, having a lot of conversations with farmers also. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, you're wearing a lot of a lot of hats for this conversation and I appreciate you bringing all those perspectives and uh, the wealth of knowledge that you have from, from working on these issues for a really long time too. So um, uh, next, uh, could we go to uh, Mike Lawrence and if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and I know this is something you've of course been working on for a long time too. I wonder if you could share uh, some thoughts and introduce yourself for, for folks. Yeah, hi. Um, all right, well, I'm Mike Lawrence, and I'm with Lawrence Meats in Cannon Falls. And um, my parents started a little uh, not-for-sale custom-exempt processing plant in 1968. And we did custom-exempt processing up until the early 90s when we were involved in getting state-inspected uh, the state inspector program, we actually, my parents and my brother testified for the uh, introduction of the Minnesota Equal Two program in the late 90s. And so we spent a little bit of time in the late 90s as an Equal Two plant, but then we built a new USDA facility in 2000, um, wanting to be state Equal Two with our idea of Minnesota products in, raised by Minnesotans, inspected by Minnesotans, and sold in Minnesota. But being 15 miles away from the Wisconsin border and in the 90s, there was no, no clear path to interstate shipping. We had to go USDA. So we've been USDA here in um, Canada Falls since 2000. Uh, our current facility, we have 
120 employees. We do about 90 head of beef a day. Um, we do further processing, make sausage also. And in 2014, we opened a USDA plant in Vermont. Um, and in Vermont, we have 60 employees and we do about 60 beef a day and we make sausage and do specialty packaging out there. So we've uh, really been working hard since the 90s when my brother and I took over. We actually developed a program called Brand Your Beliefs where we went out and taught farmers how to do direct sale and really believe in the idea of farmers having the opportunity to do direct sale um, as a supplement to their income. And um, so we've been in it for a long time and have some pretty strong feelings about what does work and what doesn't work and, and the challenges um, of all. So that's us. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, 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 for being here to, to share those uh, observations and experience with us. And I, 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 for one, didn't realize that you were operating in, in, in multiple states, and that has to be a really valuable uh, perspective to bring the conversations about state level policy to having kind of those um, comparative experiences. So uh, finally, uh, I'll turn it to uh, Mike Strand to talk about some of the federal work that he's doing at, at, MS, or at National Farmers Union. Sure, thank you, Stu, and thanks to the other panelists for being part of this today. I think I'm hoping to learn a lot from the three of you uh, to get a better grasp of how things are working in Minnesota. Um, again, I'm Mike Strands. I'm with National Farmers Union in Washington, DC. I'm, don't hold it against me, but I'm originally from Wisconsin, and I've uh, been out in D.C. for 10 years now. I grew up on a diversified small uh, farm in northeastern Wisconsin. Uh, but over the last, well, five months, I think things have taken a different uh, attitude when it comes to meat inspection and local food processing capacity due to the pandemic. Uh, you look at all the issues that have kind of collided in this area, where it's antitrust issues and consolidation in the big packing industry, uh, interstate shipment concerns for uh, how to facilitate that and to work within the very carefully constructed uh, inspection regime we have right now. I, I like the comment uh, Ms. Jewett made about how uh, we have to untangle all the permutations to get to legal inspection and sale. And uh, it's a patchwork of different uh, scenarios across the country. So National Farmers Union hears from our members across many states and each state takes a different approach to it. It's been very informative to learn about how Minnesota uh, approaches this with the work of MDA and all of you in the business, uh, but it's different in Wisconsin and it's different in Oklahoma and it's different in Kansas and uh, trying to figure out if that's what we want or if there's ways to better approach that has been the big question for us. We know what the problems are, I think. We know that our food system has for so long emphasized efficiency, and with efficiency came brittleness. And the pandemic pushed that to its limits, and it still remains to be seen exactly what the final effects will be. But I think we know what the problem is, but it's a matter of how do we get to a solution and what solutions are politically viable today, even in a time when the general public has been paying a heck of a lot more of attention to uh, agriculture than perhaps they have in a long time. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to highlight before we get into Q&A, which I think will be excellent, but uh, speaking of how the food system has been pushed to the brink uh, in the last few months, the FERN, or the Food and Environment Reporting Network, has been doing a really excellent job of assessing and graphically rep representing where there have been interruptions in the food supply chain, where there have been plant closures and things like that. So according to their latest updates yesterday, at least 333 meatpacking and food processing plants, of which 249 were meatpacking, and 46 farms and production facilities have had confirmed cases of COVID-19. Um, earlier this spring, you know, many dozens of meat plants were closed at or it's had significantly reduced production capacity. Uh, but only right now, there's only two plants that are currently closed, but production is still ramping up uh, many others. And over 32,000 workers, 27,000 of which were in meatpacking, have tested positive for COVID-19. And at least 109 workers have died uh, 
as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so we saw what happens with concentrated, consolidated, very large meatpacking operations. Uh, we need to find ways to work around that and to provide more choices to farmers, uh, which will make our food supply more resilient, provide a better uh, source of income for farmers, more markets to choose from, and also assure the public of food safety. Uh, so as a result of these problems that have been made so apparent in the last few months, there's plenty of ideas about how to change that. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to assess what's going to be most effective in the short run or most politically feasible in the short run, and then also keeping an eye towards longer term reforms in the overall meat industry. Um, I think today it'd be good to talk more about some of the options that are on the table for how we can go forward on that. I think it'll be good to come up with those during Q&A, I guess, or uh, I'll be happy to address them as, as we go. So again, thank you, Stu and Minnesota Farmers Union for putting this together and glad to be here today. Awesome, thank you so much, Mike, and, and um, appreciate you being able to join. Um, so, so first, and I think this is a, a, a smart question as a, as a value setting one, and I'll, I'll pose it on behalf of uh, Ralph Kaler, who's a MFU member and cattle producer, um, who, who put this in the comments. And I'm wondering, Dr. Neeser, maybe you could take a crack at this uh, first, and then if folks have anything to add, but could you give us like the top level view of the kind of inspection, the different levels of inspection that are available to processors in Minnesota and how producers interact with them differently, be that custom equal to or, or USDA inspection? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I think we crossed our mute buttons there. Yeah, for we a did. Second. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically there's uh, essentially three sort of inspection regimes or programs that can be, um, that we have in Minnesota. So many of you are probably familiar with cu what's custom exempt and custom exempt plants. And that's sort of the meat that goes to, comes from your processor that says not for sale. Um, basically that is intended for um, slaughter um, the processor is providing a service to the owner of an animal and cutting and slaughtering and cutting that animal up to the specifications of the customer. Um, that product cannot be sold in retail stores or farmers markets or anywhere in the state. Um, it is intended to go back to the owner of the animal. Um, over the years, this has definitely evolved to be much more than just like one owner. Um, traditionally, when this first started, it really was meant to be, you know, the farmer brings their animal in and they have it slaughtered for themselves and their family. Um, and maybe there are a few guests or something, but um, this has been, you know, evolving now to include, you know, people purchasing half or a quarter of an animal. Um, and really in this system, the owners of the animal act as their own inspectors. So we do not inspect the carcasses or the parts of this animal for safety or, or animal health um, reasons. And we do do inspections of these plants, but we generally do them on a quarterly or less frequent basis. Some plants that are very, uh, very, very clean, we may actually only inspect once a year. Um, so one to four times a year, depending on that. And we're really just looking for facilities, sanitation, um, those kinds of things. Those inspections are done by our, our meat inspectors at the state level for the most part across the state. We've got about uh, 250 of those plants. So the vast majority of our smaller plants that do meat inspection or meat processing are custom exempt processors. Um, you can also be, so just to remember that these options aren't exclusive, like you don't have to be just one or the other. So, which makes it kind of confusing. Um, but um, you can also be a Minnesota equal to processor, which would mean that um, you have an inspector there um, during the time that you slaughter those animals, the inspector's looking at all the animals to make sure that they're healthy and safe. Um, you have to have specific food safety plans, um, HACCP plans to address pathogens like E. coli, salmonella, um, listeria, depending on what processes you have. Um, and that is called equal to inspection because it's equal to USDA inspection. So it's equal to that in terms of the processors have to meet the same regulatory requirements. 
our approach to inspection is essentially equal to that of USDA. Now there's some differences, like there's some things that we do different on the state level, um, maybe in terms of how we onboard plants and how we interact with them and the kinds of resources that we provide for them. Um, and maybe even some of our inspection uh, procedures for processing might be slightly different, um, but generally we're similar to what USDA is. Um, those products that go under that program can be sold within the state, anywhere within the state. Um, they can also be donated anywhere within the state. Uh, they cannot be, at this time, sold across state lines into other states. Um, so then that moves us to USDA inspected processors. And so this is essentially the same thing as state equal to inspection, except for the inspection is done by USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service. And mostly in Minnesota, this is larger plants like our Hormel's and um, Genio's and you know those kinds of plants because obviously they're gonna be selling products to sta across state lines. Um, Mike Lorenz is on here. They actually have kind of a, a smaller plant that's a USDA and they're not a, a tiny plant, but uh, they're a smaller plant kind of in that middle range that is USDA. And there's a few um, smaller plants that are very small plants that are USDA as well. So um, particularly a few along the borders where, you know, they, they would need both say Minnesota and Wisconsin as a market or Iowa and Minnesota or whatever our, our surrounding states are. Um, and so those are um, kind of the three options. Um, meat processors can also be what's called retail exempt, meaning they have a retail store and they sell meat out their front door. Um, and that inspection doesn't come under our meat inspection program, it comes under our food inspection program. Um, but just to kind of keep in mind that one processor can have more than one, you know, they're not, ex they don't have to be exclusively one or the other. They do have to manage their sort of product streams, so they can't take custom product and sell it. They, they still have to manage and control that product, um, but they can have more than one option there. Hopefully that covers that question, I think. Excellent. Yeah, I think so. I think so. It's a, it's a, it, it is a complex question, but I, I appreciate you, you, you uh, tackling it. I wonder, you know, before we move on, you know, Jane or, 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 or Mike Strands have anything to add, um, go to you next. But I wonder, um, Mike Lawrence, do you have anything to add about kind of what informs a processor's decision to choose a particular inspection uh, level or, 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 or protocol and kind of what informs that. I know you all have, have, have had uh, various and come under various inspection protocols throughout your, your, your time in business. I hope that yeah, question well, makes um, sense. <laughs> yeah, we've done all of them. Um, we, uh, we were custom exempt and we had a, a retail meat store and uh, we were state inspected and now we're USDA inspected. And, you know, it does, it does ultimately talk to, or does ultimately work towards what business do you really want to be in or what problem are you trying to solve? And, and that's the challenge when we're talking about solving the processing issue. What does that really mean? Because, you know, some people the processing issue is that they have two beef a year that they want to process and they want to get it done in the fall and they can't get a, um, they can't get a kill spot. Uh, that's one problem. Other people, we just had somebody call and kind of berate us about not reserving capacity for injured animals. And it's like, that's not our business at all. Um, but that some people are feeling that that's a big priority. And, and then there's this direct marketing deals and, and you can format direct marketing in so many different ways. Um, um, whether you do, uh, you know, we used to promote a lot of not for sale sales of sides and quarters and stuff. So, so it really is, what is your plan? Who, who's the market you're trying to serve? I, I, I feel, um, you know, for us, USDA makes so much sense because the world is small and we cross state lines so quickly now. Um, and we work with products, very high attribute, bison, organic, you know, um, no antibiotic ever. And these really high attribute products that we work with, we have to go to the customer um, and wherever the customer is at, and they tend to be uh, large uh, urban areas. So our products that we produce travel all around. So that's why we have to be USDA. Um, hope that helps. Yes, 
Thank you. Absolutely. And then just to add a wrinkle to this, uh, just looking at it from how other states approach some of these challenges, uh, there's the Cooperative Interstate Shipment Program that seven states use, and that's a way to have state inspection, state inspected meat be shipped across state lines, being able to have your state inspection and then sell it elsewhere. Um, there's certain parameters on this that the inspection standards must be at least equal to the federal inspection program and that in order to be eligible plants must have 25 or fewer employees. Uh, this came about as a result of many years of lobbying at the federal level to get state inspected meat uh, up and running across state lines but uh, when it was part of the 2008 farm bill uh, it took several years to get implemented and has plenty of restrictions on it so that only as of just last month, this, the seventh state came online and started using CIS. Now, one of the reasons for that is the complex uh, standards that need to be met, but also states, Minnesota is a prime example, have their own program that works just fine for that state and hasn't pursued it. So uh, oftentimes when we hear about issues with addressing meat processing capacity and opening up markets for smaller processors, state inspected or interstate shipment of state inspected meat is held up as a way to do that. And there are ways to do it, but not many states have taken it up for a variety of reasons. So that just adds to the complexity here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for, 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 for adding that. And I wonder, Jane, do you have anything to add to that, you know, question about the the, the different levels of inspection that you think folks would be, be important for folks to know if they're listening in, in here? Well, um, I, yeah, there's like a whole other uh, sort of parallel world with poultry. I think what Nikki mm -hmm. described was primarily red meat. And um, with poultry, I saw there was a question in the chat about that as well. So there are some additional options with poultry, including on-farm slaughter. And uh, a little known option in Minnesota, like most people are familiar with the 1000 bird exemption for um, slaughtering on the farm with essentially no hard and fast requirements, but you have to have customers come to the farm premises to pick up the birds. But then there's also the 20,000 bird exemption for on farm slaughter that does have some facilities requirements. Um, and I've been getting a lot of questions about that one lately. Uh, actually questions where people want that to be a, an exemption and don't realize that it already exists. So mm. I would pitch that back to Nikki to talk about that one because it needs to, um, it needs to get more press. It's already there. Excellent, excellent. Well, I wonder, and thank you for mentioning that question in the comments, I think you know, I promoted um, uh, Eric Munson, who posed that question about about poultry, um, uh, to a panelist, and 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 I wonder if he, I'm gonna unmute him and see if it, he has anything to add to that as a poultry producer and someone who's been engaged on this. Hey, Eric. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's one thing that has not been said. I've even asked Department of Ag, and they said that wasn't a thing, which is the issue. But one thing we're really pushing for is poultry producers because the Poultry Act of 68 and of 67 allowed that 20,000 limit to be adopted to sell to restaurants, to hotels, to those types of things. But Minnesota only allows for the end consumer. And then what we're facing as poultry producers, the only places we can go right now is there's two in the Iron Range and the rest are down in Rochester. And so what we're seeing now, we're really feeling that Department of Ag isn't hearing us when we say we want to have that. We have restaurants that want to buy from us. We as a farm, we used to raise close to 4,000 birds when our local processor in the Brand Lakes area, no was long, no longer state certified, we lost three fourths of our farm income because we had to go from 4,000 to 1,000 because we could not sell to restaurants. We could not do that. And we're seeing a lot of farms go belly up. We've acquired four farms customer list because of that. And so has Minnesota ever looked at adopting what our 30 other states already have, allowing small producers with some oversight 
to do the 20,000 limit and sell to restaurants and co-ops and things like that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, I think, uh, Nikki, if you want to take a first crack at, at talking about that act and the 20,000 bird limit. Sure, I can do that. Um, yeah, so um, like Jane said, I think some pro some producers don't know that that 20,000 bird limit does exist and you can sell from your farm and at farmers markets. But as Eric mentioned, you cannot sell in Minnesota to restaurants um, or other types of sort of food service um, if you are under that system. Um, and the answer to that is probably not as simple as us it, as it seems like it should be, of course, but um, it's not just a matter of us adopting that federal requirement because the um, those businesses, the restaurants, the hotels, the schools, the grocers actually have to adhere to the food code, the Minnesota food code, which required to, requires approved sources of product. And, um, you know, that at the present time, um, and the federal standard for that requires um, inspected products. So um, it's as you know, it kind of goes back to that tangled web of requirements that it's not simply quite as easy as that. Now that said, you know, we are looking at some options. Um, I think that, you know, we, we want to still encourage equal to um, or USDA certification for poultry for one reason is um, if we lift that limit up to 20,000 birds that pretty much is going to guarantee that there's not going to be any plants out there because you folks who are slaughtering on farms are not going to have a need for those plants and so um, we're not going to it's, it really is hard to then promote creating an infrastructure of actual slaughter plants that smaller much smaller producers can go to um, and so it, it does become pretty complex um, and, um, you know, we have the, the, the issues, of course, around poultry processing are, are regulatory for one, uh, but also, you know, labor, it's seasonal operations. There's a lot of other factors that have influenced the ability of those poultry processors to sort of be successful. Um, and so we are looking at options and we'll probably be actually at the Department of Ag, we'll probably be holding some feedback sessions here in the later summer fall for poultry um, poultry processing, just to kind of get ideas from you folks. Um, we, we do know, I mean, we have actually been having meetings. We do know that poultry processing capacity is an issue. It's just that it's a, it's a tough nut to crack. Um, there's a lot of, like say, confounding factors that go into that, so. Um, yeah, and if anyone has any questions going forward on poultry processing, we'd be happy to talk, take that feedback and, and move forward with that. Um, you know, adopting that federal standard and, and changing other laws and regulations is certainly one option that we can look at. Yeah, this is, this is Jane. Thank I, would you. Just, um, I would just add that, uh, uh, no, I'm losing it, okay. So Nikki, if you could talk just a little bit about the facilities requirements for that 20,000 bird exemption, which again, it does only allow people to sell to individual like household consumers, not businesses, but still um, there are a lot of people who are interested in that on farm facility option at this point because there's such a bottleneck with poultry processing. And um, then I would just throw in there that one of the other confounding factors with getting sufficient poultry processing capacity is that uh, you, you can't force people to want to butcher chickens. <laughs> you know, there are um, a lot of programs out there with funding that could help people build a plant, but at the end of the day, they're just, there's a limited number of people who actually want to um, make it their life's work to butcher chickens. So. Yeah, Thank I can you. talk a little Thank bit you. more about that. Um, the facility requirements are fairly straightforward and I think um, somewhat on a similar line to some of our custom exempt, although even probably less so. Um, basically, we're looking for floors, walls, and ceilings. So you need to have, you do need to have a facility. So you can't just be outdoors. Um, and, um, you know, potable water, um, cleanable surfaces, uh, you know, some place to clean your equipment and those kinds of things. It's, it's a pretty simple building that you can use to process 
poultry under the 20,000 bird exemption. There's nothing very complicated. There's no other paperwork or administrative um, requirements that those processors need to, to meet. Um, and just to take on is, you know, honestly, I had a discussion with a processor basically said, I will hold your hand, you know, through this whole process, if you will do poultry processing in the end, they still come up, come around to say, I don't want to put your chickens, you know, so, um, you know, we've had, we've been out there talking to folks and there's actually, I think one or two that, that, that are possibly in the works that may, may move forward with that. Um, but it is, it's hard to, hard to, um, get folks, processors interested in that, and um, also figure out a way to do that that's profitable. Thank you, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. And, and, and to loop back on, on, on your uh, comment, Dr. Newser, about some, some listening sessions later in the summer, I think that sounds like a, a, a great and exciting opportunity to engage both for Eric and, and other members who, who are, are, are interested in, 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 in helping make the, the, the program work better. I wonder before we move on from from poultry, um, Mike or Mike, did did you have anything to to add on 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 poultry? I'm afraid I don't. Uh, the there's been the point about how you can only get so many people to work on that issue is a good one, and uh, one of the ways that incentives might be there is on processing matching grants. Or and I guess that goes for uh, pork and beef too, uh, is to provide incentives or at least assistance in getting uh, additional processing up and running. There's no shortage of ideas about how to do that and plenty of recommendations out there in Congress, either as actual legislation or just uh, rumors or <laughs> proposals that are being floated, but especially in a time when we see stimulus bills flying through Congress that are in the trillions of dollars, uh, surely there might be a way to get some additional funding for processing facilities that might be up and running. But that goes for poultry and that mm -hmm. goes for beef and pork too. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you. Yeah, and then we would absolutely see, like to see uh, more, more money into these programs and help get more processors online. and. And that's actually a good um, segue into a question that uh, Meg Moynihan had in the chat. And so I've, I've unmuted her and she might be able to use her video, but kind of talking about what it would take to get more processors online. And, and Mike, Lawrence, maybe if we could go to you first with, with, with for Meg's question. So Meg? Yeah, I pegged, I pegged Mike for this one, but um, my question it has to do with this long-standing dissatisfaction that we have heard for so many years about why aren't there more local processors? Why don't we have more in Minnesota? And I will say this with the, with the uh, disclosure that like Jane, I'm kind of a hybrid. I work in a non-regulatory capacity for Department of Agriculture, Minnesota Department of Agriculture, but I'm also a livestock producer and I direct market. And so I've heard these complaints for many, many years and um, they certainly have become more acute in the last three months, you know, as the big plants went down and it became clear how little redundancy we have in our meat processing system. Um, people are throwing their hands up and saying, well, if there's all this demand, why aren't people flocking to meat processing? You know, why isn't this a booming uh, industry, small industry in small towns? And so my question to you is, why don't they flock to it? What are some of the barriers that say family members have, why aren't family members taking over the family meat processing business? Why aren't entrepreneurs recognizing this as, oh, this is a great opportunity. We want to build new plants. What, what are some of the barriers and the disincentives that you've seen in your lifetime, Mike? Well, um, <clears throat> I had a business guy tell me once when it comes to business, don't tell me how much it costs, tell me how much it makes. And at the end of the day, the challenge with meat processing is um, how much money it makes. And just um, thinking about today's talk, I, I went back to last year's uh, uh, numbers and I added up the total number of hours we worked on meat processing. And our staff, our staff dedicated 200,000 hours to meat processing last year. And if you take our sales, less the little bit of plastic that we bought and less a little bit of meat we bought and divide that by 2,000 hours, you got $54 an hour. 
So those of you in farming, if you're thinking about a service industry and if you're looking at processes as service to your farm, what services are you able to hire at a $50 an hour, $55 an hour rate? You know, you take your tractor into the John Deere dealer, they're gonna bill you more than $55 an hour to fix it. And, or if you call an electrician to come out and work in the barn. You know, so the real challenge with bee processing is the margin available. And that gets back to what uh, Mike was saying is, you know, we're such a least cost food mentality that these large processors have been so efficient and can drive down their costs so low, ultimately we're benchmarked to what they do. So the real, at the end of the day, the real challenge is doing enough work to be profitable and viable at a low enough price to be at least reasonably competitive against the commodity food sources. So we can talk about all the other stuff, but at the end of the day, what really is the rub is there's not enough money unless you really commit to one another. Poultry is the best example of that. The reason there's no poultry plants is nobody's willing to make a commitment because nobody knows. And you know, you're know you off by a week on your chicken um, production and you're, you're screwed. I mean, you, if you don't have a processor lined up within a two week window, your chickens are so out of spec. And the processor is sitting there, if somebody calls and says, oh, they're not quite big enough today, I need to come next week. It's like, no, I got staff here today. So the, those are the constraints of like chicken. And, and I think that one of the best papers that I've read um, about processing in the in the in the how to make processing work was the one that Lauren Gwynn wrote back for USDA a few years back. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the paper, but it's Lauren Gwynn, um, and it's a USDA paper that she wrote on uh, uh, meat processing, and it boils down to making commitments. And if you can get people that make commitments to one another, you can build a successful organization. And the way that Lawrence Meats has gotten to the size that we've gotten to is by cornerstone customers like Organic Meat Company making real commitments to us that they're gonna come every week. Well then, once we know we have a commitment, we can build a business. And that's the same thing that we did in Vermont, where we, uh, you know, 2014, we built this business and got it up to 60 employees. Um, it's because we had customers that made real commitments to us. And, and uh, you know, as we float around, all the other challenges are solvable if you get those commitments made to one another. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I wonder if anyone else, I mean, I'm sure everyone could have something to say about, you know, what the challenges are for, um, processors coming online, but I wonder if anyone else has anything to add to what Mike shared. Um, I'll just throw in an observation that the, the COVID crisis and the processing bottleneck kind of forced me to make my um, processing appointments way out farther in advance. And there's really no reason why I couldn't have been doing that all along. I mean, when, you know, when you buy a feeder pig or when your sow pharaohs and you've got a batch of piglets, you know how many days, months, weeks it is until they need to go to the butcher. And so um, I feel like the farmers um, are being forced to step up now and make those commitments. And we could have been doing a better job all along with that. I'd like to jump in on that, Stu. The, um, thank you, Jane, that's, that's awesome. I've, I've teased farmers a lot about beef farming that, you know, I can't get a processing appointment for six weeks. It's like, it's been alive for a couple of years. So you could have projected out. And I will say that the one of my um, observations of the current COVID deal that I'm the most sad about is that we had some real customers, some real long-term customers that hadn't made commitments to us at this time. And some of these short short-term reactionary people jumped in and got the spaces tied up. And um, I think that happened at a lot of processors where capacity that was going to people that truly were doing direct marketing and, and, and really part of, the, part of our little ecosystem here got squeezed out by people that were just being opportunistic by super low prices and trying to get some cheap hogs killed and, 
and there are some capacity that I think was misallocated uh, because of that during this, this challenge. Thank you. Yeah, that's, 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 that's very helpful. And I wonder, uh, Dr. Nieser, I know you had some folks of the department who were specifically dedicated to uh, helping find processing opportunities for folks with small herds or flocks who, who were kind of displaced in the way that, that Mike described. And I wonder if there were any lessons learned there about how um, farmers can best interact and, you know, and build that relationship and that, that, that shared commitment. Yeah, so uh, we definitely at sort of at the beginning of the COVID crisis and particularly um, shortly after it became apparent that some of the larger plants were going to be highly impacted. Um, we started um, trying to, we knew we would have quite a few more inquiries than normal. And so we set up a system basically to funnel those calls to a couple of individuals who were able to hopefully um, try to connect um, some of those process, some of the livestock producers to processors um, and particularly processors that we were aware of that were interested in expanding or that had capacity. So um, for example, you know, vectors out said, you know, query all your plants, all your equal to and custom plants and see who's got room, you know, to see who's, who's got room and who's willing to add capacity. And so we just kind of kept a list and, and those folks from our marketing department could then say, okay, well, so-and-so is calling, you know, here's some plants that said they have some room or they're interested. Um, and that worked um, well at the very, very beginning um, until all of that room got filled up. <laughs> Um, and then we basically had no room, or at least our plants were reporting that they had no room. Um, and, you know, one lesson I think is that um, there's a lot of processing that can be done under custom exempt uh, that um, if people just get a little creative and um, maybe put some effort into that. And so what we saw early on is we we started our fast track equal to program for processors that were interested in you know, going to an inspected processing quickly. And, you know, we, we set that all up and um, the initial, we probably had 10 to 12 plants, maybe even 15 that were interested that we were visiting. And um, I would say at least uh, half of those called us back and said, I, I don't need equal to, I'm more busy with custom than I could possibly ever you know, manage to add equal to inspection. And so um, mm. I think we just, you know, we learned a lot about that equal to inspection is not necessarily needed, you know, and I think we knew that on a inspection level, we see a lot of really successful custom exempt plants. And so, um, you know, if they're out there just, you know, working with customers and wanting to work with customers, I think there's customers out there for them. Um, another issue has been, of course, labor, you know, just making sure that they have a big enough labor force to, to get through that. Um, before COVID, labor was a huge issue for our meat processors, and I'm guessing that has somewhat been alleviated where, you know, there's folks that are looking for jobs and are maybe a little more willing to take a job at a meat processing plant, but um, that was a lot of the early restrictions in capacity was related to labor. Like, yeah, I want to take this, but I don't have enough employees. Like, I just can't push it through. Um, or I don't have a big enough cooler or, you know, some of those things were hurdles as well. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think just oftentimes when we get someone who's interested in building a plant or doing an operation, a lot of times we'll ask the first question is, you know, where's your product going to go and do you have someone that you're going to work with? And sometimes the answer to that is, well, I don't know, I'll figure that out. And it's like, no, I think, you know, Mike's point about commitment is like, you need to have someone that's committed to working with you to make sure you're going to have product and, or going to make sure you're going to have markets. So to be successful. Well, thank you. And, and that's a good, a good segue to what I think, um, I think will probably be our final question, unfortunately, and apologies to everyone who's put incredible uh, questions in the, in the comments there. We'll certainly work to capture those and, and you know, maybe through MFU or others, we can coordinate some follow-up to continue uh, this conversation. But I wanted to turn to uh, Carla Mertz, who uh, is actually working to um, start a, a processing facility herself 
to ask about some of the challenges and, and roadblocks that she's facing and see if there are, are lessons for others who are also thinking about on-farm slaughter and the like. So, Carla, I think I've unmuted you. Um, are you able to, to pose a question? Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, I'm driving on my way, ironically, to go pick up our birds from the processor. <laughs> so, um, we, many of you know, or we've been included on the conversation of we're trying to um, start a new processing facility. And a lot of the issues that Sam and Mike made really great points, and same with Meg, uh, very similar conversation of you know, it's a very time-driven, costly project when you're talking a brand new facility. Um, we know that there's a huge issue with cold reprocessing. We live it every day. Um, we, we put our dates in a year in advance and pre-plan all of our batches for the year. And I'm just wondering, and I don't know if there's any rapid response to these that are going to be coming through through the Department of Agriculture, because at the end of the day, we can't process on our farm. Our county is not allowing it. Um, we have to be commercial or industrial. And right there off the bat, when we just got, we got all of our quotes back for our capital campaign for funding, it's now a $3.2 million project. And this is not just for poultry processing, it's for the equipment costs are over $1.5 million. So when like Mike was talking about your cost factors, it's looking at I've now got employee overhead, I've got all of these other factors. Yes, I wanna be able to help not only my farm, but other farmers around the state for Minnesota equal to. It's very expensive and these projects will take Two years before we're even open. So I'm just wondering if there's like any other any other things that the state is even thinking about doing in the future as far as helping to fund some of these the people that want to do projects to grow and add facilities. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you, Carla. Thank you for your work and, and thank you for that question. And and I think you know, first probably makes sense to go to Dr. Neeser to talk about what the state's already thinking about, but then um, maybe we can also hear from others before we have to wrap up here, um, what kind of ideas for incentives, incentives for new uh, processors are kind of on the table as Mike Strand alluded to in his introductory comment. So uh, Dr. Neeser. Sure. Um, well, I don't work in our marketing division, but um, I'm pretty familiar with some of the grants and things that they do issue or we do um, work with because we work very, very closely with them to try to um, connect processors with that with those resources. And so um, during this COVID time, we did a small mini grant and that was really just for existing processors to help them expand their capacity. Um, and that new processors or, or processors that we're building from scratch were not eligible for that particular grant. And that was this was a real small grant up to $5,000. Um, but anyone interested should really know that we typically do um, what are called value added grants or other types of grants to food processors and particularly for meat processors um, at least once a year and so oftentimes twice a year. Um, and those are those can be very large grants. So we get um, money through our agri agri funds and other type of money from the legislative um, process to allocate out through the grant process. And so those are great grants for folks that are um, either even in the business planning stages, um, you can get money to help you do a business plan. Or um, and I see here Meg posted up the value added grant uh, link on there. So um, or, you know, equipment for a new plant or, or those kinds of things. Often there's a cost sharing component to those. Uh, but um, we have done some some pretty large large grants there, um, and so that's something that folks should definitely keep an eye on. 
again, um, I'm not sure exactly the time frame. I think the late summer and fall is probably the next um, round. Meg might, Meg might be able to comment on that too. Um, so there are grants. Um, we did get a small additional uh, uh, allocation for meat processing grants here in the recent session. Um, there's, you know, there, there's significant amounts of money, but you know, you do need to realize that if you are talking about a $3.5 million project that um, you're probably going to have to um, <clears throat> look at other funding opportunities as well if you're um, if you're looking for for grant or or cooperative agreement type of situations. Meg, also, I see posted here a USDA value added producer grant program that they have through um, rural development. So there are definitely some options out there to help folks get started. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe Mike Lawrence, do you have anything to add thinking about uh, a capital campaign like that and, and the startup costs? I know you kind of covered that, but anything more? Well, it does take a lot of money and it's uh, important to try to, to share the risk somehow. So to get, um, you know, to get contracts that you can monetize by processing partners where, you know, there's some ideas that, you know, uh, instead of getting somebody to give you money directly, maybe you could give them, give you a processing contract that had very solid um, payment penalties if they don't perform and you could monetize that with a lender or, you know, there's some creative things, but it does take a lot of tenacity and a lot of money. So, um, that, that is a challenge. And that gets back to the whole, um, you know, one of my frustrations going forward and building that Jane's comment is I have trouble getting processors that would say, I'll take, you know, 10 spots in November. And if I don't show up, show up, I'll give you $200. And then, then similar processors are saying, I want to take a mortgage out on building a processing plant. And it's like, you realize that you're making a 30 year commitment on a mortgage to build a processing plant when all you really need to do is make a one or two year commitment on the amount of animals that you're going to deliver and you could probably solve the problem. So think about what the commitment means and what the access to capital means. And, and, you know, people, people that are in business could potentially monetize some of your commitments um, and help them grow and help them meet their next level. So. That's interesting thinking about those kind of commitments and, and creative contracts like that. Thank you. So we have uh, just three minutes left. I'm wondering, and I hope you'll permit me for being a little bit creative with closing comments in the interest of time, but you know, there are a number of things that we didn't have time to cover Folks, I think, came wanted to talk about the Prime Act, uh, interstate shipment we didn't dig into, CARES Act funding. I'm sure Mike Strands had some uh, uh, insightful things to say about maybe a, another round of stimulus. So I'm wondering if we could quick go around to each panelist and if you could share um, one concrete thing that folks who are listening in can do to continue this conversation, be that on the federal level or locally with their processor. Is there an email list they should sign up for, something they should read, someone they should reach out to? Um, apologies if that's both broad and specific and maybe an unhelpful way, but um, uh, maybe could we start with um, Jane? Do you have any ideas quickly in that regard? Uh, gosh, do I have so many ideas. Um, so <laughs> Uh, one thing in the comments that I caught that didn't have a chance to get discussed at all was mobile processing, but that has been discussed among a group that Stu and I are both involved in, um, resilience and agriculture, kind of a subgroup about livestock processing. That's been a topic of discussion and the regional sustainable development partnerships at the U of M in extension have been talking about it too. And uh, so I think connecting with one of those groups to, to keep that discussion going, I think there's potential to come up with some modular plans for mobile processing units that, uh, that could help with solving some of, especially the poultry processing bottlenecks in the state. But it's, it's in early days yet, it's gonna take a lot more work to move that forward. 
Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. So maybe concrete email me and I'll connect you with Kathy Drager or, or, or the livestock group to talk more about mobile processing. Um, Dr. Neither, wondering if you have a, a thought on a concrete thing uh, folks can do when they sign off the call to, to, to continue the conversation. Well, I think from our perspective at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture is we just we want to hear from you. So I think um, you'll know that our commissioner's office and I think I saw Tom made a comment on here. Uh, Commissioner Peterson's always really open to hearing folks' ideas and that extends down to myself and um, our meat inspection staff. Um, we want to hear what your issues and challenges are. Um, we want to get your feedback. And so, you know, we're going to need your participation as we go forward here, have some listening sessions. Um, it's a complex problem and, you know, there's no one solution. We need everyone to help help generate ideas for us. And, um, you know, the best ideas are going to come from you and probably not from us. So we need to, we, we want you to participate and, and give us feedback. Um, so you can find all of our contact information on our website. Um, just reach out to any one of us and, uh, you know, have a phone call. That works, too. Fantastic. Thank you. And I appreciate how, how responsive and open you all are. I know that takes time and, and, and it's very much appreciated. Um, uh, Mike Lawrence, and we'll save uh, um, Mike uh, uh, Strands for last year, but do you have anything the folks can do when they sign off to um sure the the one thing that i would encourage everybody to do is to try to be very clear on what problem they're trying to solve so when we say the processing problem it's a very complicated thing because you know uh, on one level we're trying you know talking about redundant capacity at scale well for for uh, lawrence meets to replace one jbs plant you'd need to build 100 of them that's two per state every state in the country and we'd take out one of those plants so when you're talking about solving that problem of uber commodity that's a different problem than when you're talking about how do we process uh, chickens off of jane's farm for her in this very um, regional economy so as we go to solve as we talk about solving these problems let's be very specific on what problem we're trying to solve is my thought Excellent. Thank you. Good advice for this problem and, and, and so many others. Uh, Mike Strand. Sure thing. Uh, and yeah, that's Mike's point about being certain about what problem you're trying to address really is at the heart of all this. And it, it probably is better described as four or five different problems that have all cropped up at once rather than just one processing problem. Uh, as for an action item, I, I would encourage uh, everybody to Keep an eye on federal legislation in the, in the coming month or two. Uh, it's very likely that there's going to be some sort of uh, effort to address a processing issue. I suppose it should be more specific than that, but in an effort to encourage more medium to small sized processing, uh, whether it's through matching funds or through helping uh, small plants pay for federal inspectors over time or even some more dis debate about the Prime Act, which we haven't really had a chance to talk about, but the Prime Act, which would uh, extend the custom uh, slaughter exemption to uh, restaurants, hotels, grocery stores, and other limited establishments. Uh, and then also the New Markets uh, Bill, which is out there from Senator Rounds from South Dakota, which would uh, kind of circumvent or duplicate the CIS program with just uh, state inspected. Both of those bills are uh, caught up in a lot of controversy and probably aren't moving forward anytime soon just because of the uh, opposition they've generated from some of the consumer advocacy groups and food safety groups. Uh, that said, there's a few different problems at play here. It's medium and small size processing, it's antitrust in the big packers, and uh, just the lack of resiliency that we've seen in the meat industry writ large. So keep an eye on things. Uh, follow National Farmers Union on social media. Uh, I recommend that and Minnesota Farmers Union for that matter too. And uh, thanks again for the chance to be here today. Fantastic, fantastic. So from, from the group I have from Jane, connect with RSVPs and other folks working on mobile slaughter. Be sure to reach out to MDA. 
uh, be clear about the problem we're trying to solve and, and engage in, in, in federal policy. And a great way to do that is, is through Farmers Union and, and National Farmers Union, of course. So uh, I apologize that I'm signing off as, as, as there's some lawn mowing going, <laughs> going on at my place here. But I, I so, so appreciate um, all the folks on the panel uh, all the folks who asked questions and everyone who signed on. I know everyone is, is, is very busy and, and I appreciate you making the time. So looking forward to continuing this important conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Stu, for organizing it.